wow, we've come a long way. Now, um, oftentimes, I, ho I hope that this is really kind of giving you a um, an overview of, of the Old Testament, helping you understand how things fit together. Um, if you want to know specifically how to how to apply the Old Testament to your life, um, I'll, I'll be uploading another video uh, video series called Understanding the Bible. Uh, but uh, that's a few weeks away. Um, uh, what we do is we think because Jesus came, um, you know, we, well, let, me, let me say this a different way. So in the New Testament, the authors do the legwork for us. They use the same, Bi the same Bible, they use the Old Testament, okay? But the thing is, is they draw the application for us. So what we do is we read the New Testament, and we think that because they found a new application from the same God's principles, um, that... Uh, it is, you know, inspired or whatever, and then the Old Testament is just kind of obsolete and has no purpose whatsoever. Um, and it's not like that, okay? Remember, the Old Testament is what the New Testament is based on, okay? The things that, that, that Paul said, where did he get those things from? Do you think it was all divine revelation? Well, probably not. Once again, those things were, 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 were given in the Old Testament, um, and, and he was... Um, he, he, he just applied it, okay? Um, and Galatians talks about this. Uh, you know, Romans talks about it to a good, good extent. And um, so it's important not to write out certain parts of the Bible, uh, which, takes, which takes us all the way down to the exile. Wow, what a long time. Um, I mean, Gen the first five books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, that talked about from the beginning of time all the way down to about 1400 or 1200, somewhere in there. Um, then Joshua and, and, and Judges picked up immediately after that, going, and Judges ended at about 1050 or so. First Samuel picked up about 1050 or so and went all the way down to, um, you know, where Second Samuel ends and uh, 971 or somewhere around there. Um, and then Kings picks up with King Solomon. You know, all, these, all these things, and we've, we've covered all this stuff all the way down uh, to 722, um, and so we'll pick up there. Um, let me move this camera out of the way, because you're not going to be able to see. There we go. So, um, Judah's all alone, 722 uh, to 586. Um, this, uh, this is where the Samaritans come through, and Assyria conquered uh, Israel. They moved the people out and they moved other people in. Now, these people were, were, were then took up the name Samaritans. Now they took up on a form of Judaism, but um, because it was not pure Judaism, um, you know there was obviously some tension there. So Judah is devastated in 701, but they are not. They do not fall. Okay. Uh, Babylon rebels in 652. Now the little little history about Babylon. Uh, there was the the old Babylonian Empire with Hammurabi and whatnot. Uh, but then uh, what had happened was when Assyria had, had risen into power um, in the 700s sometime, I want to say, um, they got tired of Babylon because they were a thorn in their side, so they, they just wiped it out. But here's the thing. Babylon, it, 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 for us Christians, is a sign of evil, but for them, at the, especially at the time, it was a sign of power. It was a sign of the gods and whatnot. And so um, a later king comes up. His name was Esar Haddon. And he rebuilds Babylon to make, basically, it seems to me as a political move to make people happy, to make the gods happy or whatever. Um, so uh, whatever his reasons actually were, um, he rebuilds it, but then, you know, it, they, they end up rebelling again. Um, and and so that that's the start of that in 652. Now Nahum com, comes and prophesies in 650, and his message is basically saying, you know what, Nineveh, you did turn before, but now you've gone back to your old ways. And we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, so in Habakkuk in 630, Zephaniah in 627, Jeremiah in 627 to 580, okay? Um, and so he sees before the fall of, of Ju Judah all the way to after the fall of Judah. So Babylon emerges as a power in 626 and then comes and, 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 and defeats Assyria's capital of Nineveh in 612 and this, uh, does a few more skirmishes and beats them completely in 609. Judah has made a vassal state when Babylon then comes down and has a tour uh, down to, I think they go as far as Egypt, I don't remember, um, but makes Judah a vassal state. Uh, Daniel is taken in this um, in this attack uh, to Babylon. Uh, that's in 605 to about 530. It was when he prophesied. Judah is defeated in 597. Um, I know it says Lamentations there, 
but um, it asks actual limitations was written um, in five, after 586 or in 586 when Judah is destroyed. Uh, just a little bit down. Ezekiel is, however, taken in 593 about, and he prophesied to about 570. Uh, maybe he was taken in 597, um, but he prophesied about 593 to 570. Uh, now, Judah is destroyed, I mentioned that, in 586, and this is where the books of Kings and Psalms find their origin. When the people from Judah are in exile uh, in Babylon. Um, so, then Babylon falls in 539, and uh, Persia takes over. Now, if you look, Babylon really wasn't a power that long. Um, so, I mentioned this before, but here's a map. Here's Babylon. Started getting steam, came up here, took over Nineveh, and then swung down here and um, took over, made, made, um, made uh, um, Judah a vassal state. Um, so... Uh, hopefully that gives you a little more historical context of what's going on. Now, Hezekiah and Josiah are going to be the last two good kings. Now, if you rem remember, in a previous lesson, I think two lessons ago, I talked about Joash. And I talked about how um, his, I think it was his grandma, Athaliah, was uh, really evil and tried to wipe out the family line so that she could rule. Um, I looked that up. That was Joash. Uh, but um, Josiah, however... Um, is the one list here. He reigns at, um, he, he begins reigning at about eight years old or so. And I always confuse the two, it is wh where it all came from. Um, but uh, Josiah uh, makes a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of reforms. Now, it's interesting that Joash and Josiah were both reformers. Um, It does say, though, in, in verse 26, however, of, 23 of, uh, of chapter 23 in 2 Kings, However, the Lord did not turn from the fierceness of his great wrath, which his anger burned against Judah, because of all the prov provocation with which Manasseh had provoked him. See, it constantly refers to Manasseh being this really evil person. So Hezekiah is an is a, is a overall good king. He does some dumb stuff towards the second half of his, of his reign, but overall... Um, he gives birth to Manasseh after he's healed from the illness. You know, maybe it would have been better for him to have died. Honestly, um, he messed up with Babylon. He messed up with um, uh, his son. You know, uh, just worth considering. Manasseh reigns from 698 to 643, so reigns you know a good sizable amount of time, longer than Hezekiah reigned. Um, and then Ammon reigns from 642 to 640. Obviously, very short. Josiah is a reformer. And uh, he finds the book of the – I was actually just looking that up right now. Um, he finds the book uh, in chapter – where is it? The lost book here. In chapter 22, he finds um, the lost book um, of, the, of, the, of the promise. And, and so he's going through this, and he finds it, and he finds the Passover and all this stuff, and he's like, wow. There's a lot of stuff we are not doing, and we need to start doing it like yesterday. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, he starts reinstituting stuff, and, and even does the does the Passover when it hadn't been done forever, and still, uh, still, um, it, it doesn't uh, um, it doesn't um, stop the wrath, wrath of the Lord because you know obviously they had done a lot of really evil and wicked things. Um, and so that takes us uh, to um, Jehoahaz, also called Shalem, uh, by Jeremiah in 609, but he very short reign. Jehoiakim in 609 to 598. Jehoiakim in 590, and then Zedekiah from 597 to 586. Now, if I remember correctly, Zedekiah was actually put up by um, by the king by Nebuchadnezzar. So. Um, Now, in 2 Chronicles 23, it mentions uh, Joash, um, and it mentions Athaliah there. And it mentions when Jehoiada made a covenant between himself and all the people in the king that they would be the Lord's people. And all the people went to the house of Baal and tore it down, and they broke its pe in pieces his altars and his images, and killed Matan, the, pr uh, the priest of Baal, before the altars. Moreover, Jehoiada placed the offices of, of the house of the Lord under the authority of the Levitical priest, whom David had assigned over the house of the Lord, to offer the burnt offerings of the Lord, as it is written in the Law of Moses. Um, now, it keeps on going, but... Um, it does mention, though, that um, Joash um, 
Um, in 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 let's see where is this? Uh, in the end of twenty four, it says when they had departed. Um, Here in 23. Now it happened at the turn of the year that the army of the Arameans came up against him, and they came to Judah and Jerusalem, destroyed all the officials of the people from among the uh, people, and sent all their spoil to the king of Damascus. Indeed, the army of the Arameans uh, came with a small number of men, yet the Lord delivered a very great army into their hands, because they had forsaken the Lord, the God of their fathers, thus they executed judgment on, jo on Joash. When they had departed from him, for they left him very sick, his own servants conspired against him because of the blood of the son of Jehoiada the priest, and murdered him on his bed. So he died, and they buried him in the city of David, but they did not bury him in the tombs of the kings. Now these are the, the, those who conspired against him, Zabad and uh, Jehozabad. Now I want to establish, because I did mess up on a previous lesson, I said that Joash tried to stop, um, tried to stop the, the, the pharaoh. From going up, but that was actually Josiah. Um, um, I, I'm trying to find a reference to give you for that because it, it is important. Um, oh, and another thing is Josiah did repair the temple, which was at least at the time a very big deal. Um, after, it says in 2 Chronicles 35, After all this, when Josiah had set the temple in order, Necho, king of Egypt, came out to make war at Carchemish on the Euphrates, and Josiah went out to engage him. But Necho sent messengers to him, saying, What have we to do with each other, O king of Judah? And so, you know, Josiah tries to do this, and because of it, his reign is cut short, and he dies. Now, he reigned a good long time, but he could have reigned longer. You know, and obviously he was doing good things. It mentions twice that the Passover is observed in Chronicles. Um, so I, I just wanted to correct that error. It was not Joash who opposed the the Pharaoh and got killed. That was Josiah. Uh, lo much later, uh, Joash was the one who um, Athaliah was the one the, the queen was 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 reigning and, and he they killed her and and set him up. Josiah was the one who who did another reformation and uh, tried to oppose the um, pharaoh. So I just wanted to draw emphasis to that because I hate it when I, when I mess up on, on those details and I just want to make sure everybody understands um, where it specifically I had messed up on. So Jeremiah 22.10 um, says, uh, Do not weep for the dead or mourn for him, but weep continually for the one who goes away, for he will never return or see his native land. For thus says the Lord in regard to Shalem, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, who became king in the place of Josiah's father, who went forth from this this place. He will never return there. Um, so, and then Jehoiakim is mentioned there in Jeremiah 22, 18 through 19. Um, Therefore, thus is the Lord in regard to Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah. Now, remember there it says son of Josiah. In, in Hebrew, the term son doesn't really work like that. In fact, in Daniel, I believe it is, it mentions um, that one of the king's Belshazzar, I think is his name, is the son of Nebuchadnezzar, but he wasn't. He was like the grandson or great grandson or something like that. The term doesn't mean direct descendant. Okay, it can mean it means more of um, uh, descendant by extension, kind of. Um, so in in some cases, even if someone was on the same throne, they could be called the son of. So, um, and then in Jeremiah twenty one one through eight, it mentions uh, Zedekiah. The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord when King Zedekiah sent him, pastor the son of Malchijah, and Zephaniah the priest, the son of Messiah, saying, Please or inquire of the Lord on our behalf, for Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, is warring against us. See, what happened is Zedekiah, I believe, was set up by Nebuchadnezzar, and then he goes and rebels, and so, you know, Nebuchadnezzar came back. So, there's the image once again of, of, what's, of the surrounding areas. Judah, once again, is a lot smaller um, uh, than it is there. But um, and that takes us to the prophet Nahum. Whew, we've covered a lot of ground. A lot of ground. N and Nahum prophesied about 650s, as I mentioned before. Um, now, this was obviously Assyria was a power technically, but Babylon was also um, 
something that was on the rise. Um, his audience was Assyria. This is the second of the prof recorded prophets that go to um, specifically to Assyria. Um, yeah, it mentions the land of Bashan. That's in the Trans Jordan. Remember, on the east side of the River Jordan, um, north of north of I think it's northeast of the Sea of Galilee or somewhere around there. Um, then it mentions Carmel. We talked about this in another lesson. That's northern Israel. Um, it talks about uh, Lebanon. This is Israel's northern boundary, the Lebanon Mountains. Um, Damas Syria had had that mostly. Um, so uh, best forest and pasture region. And one one through eight, it says, uh, uh, "A jealous and avenging God is the Lord. The Lord is avenging and wrathful." Goes down to three. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power. He rebukes the sea and makes it dry. It dries up all the rivers, Bashan and Carmel wither. The blossoms of Lebanon wither. There in verse four. Mountains quake because of him in verse five. And the hills dissolve. Indeed, the earth is upheaved by his presence. The world and all the inhabitants in it. Who can stand before his indignation? Who can endure the burning of his anger? And I'm sure you see kind of the flow of what's happening here. Um, it mentions no Ammon. This is Thebes. It mentions Ethiopia, Egypt, Put, Libya, which is Lubim. Um, Mm -hmm. In 3, 8 through 15, just kind of not really wanting to touch on this very much. Are you better than No Ammon, which is Thebes, um, uh, which was situated by the rivers of the Nile with wa water surrounded her, whose rampart was the sea, whose wall consisted of the sea. Ethiopia was her might, and Egypt too, without limits. Remember, Ethiopia is south of Egypt. Put and Libyan were among her helpers. I believe that is also south of um, south of Egypt. Uh, there around the Libya, uh, I mean, sorry, the Egypt um, region. And Libya is also called Lubim. Um, it's the same area. And if you know anything about geography, you'll know about where, where that is at. Um, but that was in um, 663 that um, uh, Thebes was destroyed. So uh, it had to have been, you know, this prophecy had to have been after that. Um, but that basically gives, an, it gives a very brief thing there. Uh, it's not as important as you understand every historical thing as you understand the setting of, of the prophecy and the main events of what's happening. So all that he's talking about, it's not important to know where is Libya and Lib or Libum or whatever, where is Egypt, where is put. What is important for this prophecy is that you understand um, what his point is in the prophecy itself. Um, so I really don't want to spend too much time on it. It's kind of a waste of, of this course's time. Um, there are a lot of courses that, that will that will talk about the minor prophets in greater detail. This just isn't it. Um, so a real, real simple outline. Real simple outline. Uh, chapter 1 through chapter 2, verse 2 is the zeal and power of God, the siege and destruction of Nineveh in chapter 2, 3 through 13, and then the curse and certainty of Nineveh's downfall in chapter 3. Um, the basic message is, a hundred years earlier, Nineveh repented. It returned to wickedness. Assyria made Judah one of its vassal states. Nahum predicted that it would tumble. So, um, once again, just a real close look at the book. I mean, honestly, the, the best way to understand the prophets is, besides this kind of a thing, that we're doing just a brief walkthrough, is to go and study them. You know, read the Old Testament. I'm surprised by how many um, Christians have never read the Old Testament, They've never read the Bible through. You know, um, there's a lot of stuff you're missing out on. Um, and you really won't even know what you're missing out on without reading it, so I encourage you to read it. Um, that takes us to the prophet Habakkuk. Now, Habakkuk is a very interesting prophet. It's only like three chapters long, I think. Um, yeah, three chapters long, but it has a lot of content. Now, um, it actually starts out as a dialogue between God and the prophet, okay? So let, let me kind of back up here. Um, he prophesied about 630. Assyria was still in power, but Babylon was starting to, you know, get some interesting movements. And remember, they emerged in 626 as a power. Um, so the audience is Judah. Um, but it's interesting because God is you chooses to use the the more wicked people to um, to reprimand his people. It's just interesting how, how God does that. It's like wow, God, are you, are you sure you know what you're doing? Yes, yes, he does. Um, so uh, the Chaldeans, it mentions that those are the people from Babylon. Um, I know sometimes we get a little bit lost. Like who's the Chaldeans? They are the Babylonians, the people from Babylon. Um, so in one one through seven it mentions them, um, and it says, you know, hey God, how are you? Why are you letting e evil develop? Why are you letting evil triumph? Basically, and then he says, oh, I, I, I'm going to do something with Cal with the Chaldeans, and he says, whoa, 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 not cool. 
um, you know, it really wasn't the answer that, that Habakkuk was looking for. Um, so in 2, 1 through 5, it says, I will stand on my guard post and station myself on the rampart, and I will keep watch to see what he will speak to me and how I may reply when I am reproved. See, he knew that he was wrong. You know, and, and so it begs the question, I'll, I'll wait for that. For the vision is yet for the appointed time, and it hastens toward the goal and will not fail. Though it tarries, wait for it, for it will certainly come and will not delay. Behold, as for the proud one, his soul is not right within him. So I want to stop here. First off, uh, Habakkuk was being a little bit prideful, but he realized that he was being prideful. And so he comes to the Lord and he says, okay, I'll understand. But then he has a little bit of a play on words because then he goes down here in verse 4 and says, Behold, as for the proud one, his soul is not right within him, but the righteous will live by his faith. So it kind of sets up, the, sets up this contrast. Are you a prideful person or are you living by faith? You know, and the Bible says, I, I'm pretty sure it's that, that line that the Bible says continually, um, the righteous will live by faith. So, in chapter 3, verses 16 through 19, we see no matter what faith develop in Habakkuk, that he sees what's going on, he says, you know what, God, I, I don't, I, I, I'm just going to wait on you and see what you do. No matter what, he, he had this dependence on the Lord. Um, so the outline then is, in chapter 1 through 2, a struggle with God's purposes. Have you ever struggled with God's purposes? Yeah, Habakkuk did too. Remember, prophets were not people who, oh, I have a word from the Lord. You know, they they were real people with real struggles. They didn't they didn't necessarily always like their message or always liked who they were going to. Uh, in chapter three, he yields to God's purposes. So the main message is Habakkuk couldn't understand why God seemed to do nothing about the wickedness in society. He soon learned that God is still in control of the world despite the apparent triumph of evil. So that takes us to the prophet of Zephaniah. Whew. We're going through a lot of stuff really fast. I encourage you to pause, rewind, read through the books yourself. You'll learn a lot, I guarantee it. Um, and just study, 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 study. Um, so the date that the, the Zephaniah prophesied was about 627. Assyria was still in control, technically, but remember, this is right before Babylon comes to comes to as it emerges a power. So uh, the audience is for Judah. Um, it is possible that Zephaniah is a descendant of King Hezekiah, but it's very unlikely. It mentions a uh, son of Hezekiah um, in the days of Josiah, son of Ammon, king of Judah, um, in, in the beginning of the prophecy, but eh, unlikely. Now, it mentions in 1, 7 through 13, it mentions these different places. Um, let's see. The Fish Gate, the Sang Quarter. These are different districts of, of Jerusalem. Um, so... There's that. Uh, the uh, basic outline for Zephaniah, once again, we're not really looking at content of this either. Judgment for Judah in 1 two, ver, through 2, 3. Judgment for the nations in 2, 4 through 15. Judgment for both in 3, 1 through 8. Kind of makes a nice little circle there. And then restoration for both in 3, 9 through 20. So the message is a day will come when God, as judge, will severely punish all nations. But after judgment, he will show mercy to his faithful. Um, very, very good, very encouraging. Um, so that takes us to the prophet Jeremiah, and we'll just go through Jeremiah kind of quickly, and then we'll stop at, with him. So he prophesied, I mentioned this, from about 627 to about 580. Uh, this was during the time of Assyria, but he saw Babylon emerge as a power and take over, um, and then, you know, come and... and, and and uh, take uh, destroyed Judah as well. Uh, his audience was to Judah. He lived in a place called Anathoth. Um, uh, it was a Levite town there near Jerusalem. Um, you could walk out and see Jerusalem. Um, <clears throat> he was known. He was called the Weeping Prophet. He struggled greatly with his calling. Um, he was definitely not in it for the show of it. He definitely did not uh, get a good time from this. In chapter twenty. Um, 7 through 10 he says okay but if I if I uh, um, you have deceived me and I was deceived you have overcome me and prevailed I have become a laughing stock all day long everyone mocks me for each time I speak I cry aloud I proclaim violence and destruction because for the word of the Lord has resulted in reproach and derision all day long but if I say I will not remember him or speak anymore in his name then in my heart it becomes like a burning fire he was unhappy when he spoke he was unhappy when he didn't speak we have this idea that if you're in God's will, you'll always be content. Nope. Definitely not. Sometimes you still will not be content. Um, so he started young and never mentioned 1, 1 through 10, and 16, 1 through 5 mentioned that. He was told not to marry uh, as a sign uh, because, you know, the place would be taken over. Um, and it's, it's all right, young. The word used there seems to imply that he was like maybe 17 or so. 
Um, it's a word that's that's mentioned for young people, but it, not definite. So just keep that in mind. Um, he did face much persecution. Uh, he was put in put in locks. He was put in a cistern. He was beaten. All kinds of different bad things happened to him. And I put down some references there. Uh, Baruch was a scribe. Now I mentioned this in the introduction. A lot of times prophets would have scribes that would write down their messages for them, distribute some of their messages for them, that kind of stuff. Uh, maybe even compiled some of their some of their writings together after uh, the prophet had died. He was taken to Egypt, as a reference there is 42, 18 through 40 through 7. Against his will, he told them not to go. They took him with them, um, and uh, um, it seems as though he died there. At least that's what tradition claims. So an outline, real basic. God calls Jeremiah in chapter 1. Jeremiah's evaluation in chapter 2 through 10. Judah didn't learn. <laughs> he, he constantly was proclaiming this message that, no, message that nobody was listening to. In 3.10, it says, Yet in spite of all this, her treacherous sister Judah did not repent to me with all their all her heart, but rather in deception, declares the Lord. So it has this constant, you know, show. You know, okay, Israel fell, and it was an example to you, but you didn't learn anything. So now it takes us to Judah, and you're now you're going to fall. So, um... Shiloh is a holy place that, once again, mentioned in, jo in Joshua 18.1. Read what, what happens there in 18.1. But then in Psalm 78, read what happens there. And then Jeremiah 7.12, read what happens there. You see the development of the deterioration of a holy place. Um, and, and that's actually a large theme in a lot of the writings at this time, is the, the places that were holy becoming desolate. Um, they, the people did definitely trust their rituals. In 7.16-25, through 25, it talks about this. Um, they very much so depended on their rituals. As for you, do not pray for this people, and do not lift up a cry or prayer for them, and do not intercede with me, for I do not hear you. Do you not see what they are doing in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem? So once again, the holy place is being made uh, profane. Jeremiah wrestles with God and man in chapters 11 through 20. Uh, Jeremiah obviously becomes God's example. In fact, in one spot, he even buys a place um, before the... Um, before the people are, are come back to Jerusalem um, to show that they would come back. Um, ben Hinnom is mentioned, that's the valley south of Jerusalem. Um, it says that in 19.2. Then go out of the valley of uh, Ben Hinnom, which is by the entrance of the potsherd gate, and proclaim there the words that I tell you. Um, and then um, Mager Mesabib uh, means terror on every side. It mentions that in 20, verse 3. Uh, when he, um, Pasher persecutes Jeremiah, um, and that means terror on every side. I, but I think, and I think it says it actually clarifies that for itself. Um, Jeremiah challenges the elite in chapters 21 through 29. So you can see how bad this is going for Jeremiah. Um, uh, the prophets uh, themselves opposed him. Um, you know, obviously not a good sign. Uh, <laughs> Um, and, and, you know, he was talking to people who had hardened hearts that were not willing to listen no matter what he would say. Yet in chapter 30 through 33, we have what's called the Book of Comfort. You know, that God is, that God is um, not, not wanting destruction. It's interesting. God was still faithful through all, throughout all of this. 31, 31 says... Um, um, Behold, days are coming to close the Lord, and I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Now, it's interesting to note that he's prophesying about these things, about them coming back before they'd ever even been taken. Now, how cool is that? Um, that you know, hey, you're going you're gonna to go, you're going to go. But then he says, hey, after you, after you go, um, you're going to come back, and this is for your good. Um, so we see that God is so faithful. Um, even despite uh, Judah's much long time of being unfaithful. So we have a failure of Jerusalem's leadership in 20, 34 through 39, um, and he uses the examples of the Rechabites who obeyed their earthly father there in chapter 35. Um, he uses them as an example, why are you not obeying me, your heavenly father? So uh, Jerusalem after his fall in chapter 40 through 45, oracles about the nations in 56 through 51. We mentioned this Egypt, they're uh, west of, of Israel, Philistia on the border there. Moab to the to the east um, came from Lot. Ammon from to the east, which came from Lot. Edom from Esau um, to the east. Damascus to the north, which is Syria. Uh, Chemosh, it mentions him. He was the chief god of Moab. Um, Kedar and Hazar are Arab tribes. I know it mentions them. Elam, we talked about this, was east of Babylon. Bel or Marduk was the chief god of Babylon. Um, Sariah is commissioned 
uh, I mean, it kind of kind of explains itself. I'm just giving you a real brief, um, real brief um, overview here. And I think it's Jeremiah who actually sends uh, his scribe uh, Baruch with a message to to Babylon. I believe that was him. Um, but Jeremiah, uh, Jerusalem's fall is revisited in chapter 51. Uh, because some of the wording it is possible that Jeremiah had something to do with uh, the books of Kings. Um, possible. Uh, maybe not necessarily likely. But that takes us to the prophet of Daniel, a very complicated book that's going to uh, take us a long time to get into, so we're going to stop here. Hope you enjoyed this. Uh, we'll look at Daniel and... Uh, Lamentations, and uh, I believe Kings and Psalms are our next lesson as well. So uh, I'll see you next time.